Monsignor Thomas J. Richter has been the rector of the Cathedral of the Holy Spirit since August of 2012. He was ordained a priest of Jesus Christ on June 13, 1996 at Cathedral of the Holy Spirit. A graduate of St. Mary Central High School, Monsignor Richter is the son of Victor and Mary Richter of Minokin. He received his theological seminary formation at the Pontifical North American College and the Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas in Rome. He was honored with the title of Monsignor, Chaplain to His Holiness, on November 19, 2012, by Pope Benedict XVI. He was commissioned on February 10, 2016, by Pope Francis as a missionary of mercy for the Jubilee Year of Mercy. Prior to being assigned as a rector of the cathedral, Monsignor Richter served as director of vocations for the Diocese of Bismarck for 11 years. During that time, he served on the executive board of the National Conference of the Diocesan Vocation Directors. Monsignor Richter is the author of two booklet, booklets on discernment, Is Jesus Calling You to Be a Catholic Priest? and Lend Your Own Voice to Christ. We are thankful tonight to the University of Mary for their sponsorship of Monsignor Richter. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Monsignor Richter. Thank you, Mikey. Thank, thank you. you, Dick. Thank you. Thank you, Mikey. Thank you, Dick. Thank you, everyone, for your warm welcome. It is an honor to be able to address the good and faithful people of God here in the Diocese of Bismarck on this thirst, at this Thirst Com Conference on uh, this Saturday evening. I'm honored. I had the privilege of being here last night for the opening keynote from Father Dwight Longenecker. I thought it was extraordinary. He grabbed my attention right from the beginning when he held up the two books he has just recently authored. When I saw this man was published, I knew he deserves my attention. And then I went down into the hall, and he has 11 more books. 13 books. And I figured a guy who's published deserves attention, and I trust you all think the same. And so following his lead, I want you to know Ten years ago, I published a 15-page pamphlet. <laughs> and only half of it is pictures. <laughs> Many months ago when Bishop Kagan said, I'm going to be the one giving the keynote tonight, I said, Bishop, I'm honored, but why me? He said, because I couldn't get Matthew Kelly. <laughs> I said, Bishop, even when you can get Matthew Kelly, you can't get Matthew Kelly. <laughs> and then he said, uh, actually, it's because the speaker's budget was tight, and you're not going to cost me a dime, Monsignor. <laughs> you get what you pay for. Dear people, the secret to life is a heart that knows how to receive from God. The secret to life is a heart that knows how to receive from God. It's the heart of Mary. Knowing and having the mercy of God is not as simple as God giving us mercy. We must receive it. God gives it. We receive it and live out of it. It's the Christian life. And it requires a choice on our part. And this mercy God offers isn't once in a lifetime. It's not once in a year. It's not once a week. It's not once a month. He is always pouring out mercy. And our heart was made, it was made to receive it. And in receiving it, it makes us good. 
It makes us moral. It makes us loving. It makes us happy. The secret to life is a heart that knows how to receive from God. And so for my talk tonight, I want to walk us through five steps, five basic steps. They're really basic. I'm afraid I'm not going to teach you much tonight. They're really basic, but they are the gold. They're the gold. Five steps on how to receive the mercy of God in our hearts through the exercise of faith. But before I do that, I need to address three things. First, what I mean by the exercise of faith. Second, the purpose of mercy. What is God after when he, show, when he shows mercy? What's his end game? And third, I want to unpack for you two words that we have used in our tradition to describe mercy. You got that? Get ready. Hang on. Here we go. So the exercise of faith. What do I mean by the exercise of faith? At the most basic level, this is what I mean. When my thoughts or my experience or my feelings disagree with what Jesus has revealed, I choose not to believe them. When my thoughts, my feelings, my experience disagree with what faith says, I do not believe them. For example, when I feel I'm all alone, I know that's not true. Because through baptism, the blessed Trinity dwells within me. So I exercise faith and I don't believe it. I say, thank you, God, for being with me. And if I don't do that, I'm not living in faith. If I go to confession and make a sincere, contrite confession, and then three days later, when I'm eating breakfast, I have thoughts that I might not be forgiven. I know that's not true. So I don't believe them. And I exercise faith saying, Jesus, thank you for forgiving me. And I go back to eating my Cheerios. If I'm a young person and I think that God's will may not be what's best for me, and it makes me afraid, I know that's not true. God can only and always want what's best for me, so I don't listen to him. And I exercise faith. And I say, Father, your will be done, whatever you want. Give it to me. And if I don't do that, I'm not living in faith. That only in faith, dear people, do we receive the gifts of God, including the mercy of God. If I don't live by faith, if you don't live by faith, our experience of God becomes the experience of Martha or the experience of the elder son in the parable of the prodigal son. And that experience is not rare. Of all the biblical characters that Jesus does not def affirm or defend, I find Martha and the elder son the most offended people in the Bible by people in the pews. More than once when I have preached on Martha at Mass, more than once a woman has come up to me after Mass to greet me and said something like, but Father, somebody has to make the coffee. We want to defend Martha. Some time ago, I gave a talk to a group of moms at a women's retreat, and for it, I used the story of Martha and Mary. In my talk, in my talk, I pointed out that Martha wasn't serving Christ. She was serving herself. She wasn't being generous. She was being self-centered. 
She wasn't doing the will of God. She was doing her own self-will. Well, I tell you, I just about didn't get out, out of there alive. These mothers threw diaper bags at me. I was dodging car seat, uh, yeah, car seats. Why do we want to defend Martha and the elder son? Because so often we identify with their experience. And we so often identify with their experience because we so often do not exercise faith. And we follow lies that make life hard. And so to receive the mercy of God, I must exercise faith. It happens in faith. Second, so what is mercy after? What is God after when he shows us mercy? What's his purpose? Why? Is it to console us and encourage us? In many ways, yes. In many ways, yes, but it's much more complicated than that. Especially if I have fallen off track. One of the greatest acts of mercy in the history of Christianity that Jesus ever performed was the conversion of Saul on the road to Damascus into Paul, St. Paul. And that act of mercy, that experience of mercy, came in the form of getting knocked to the ground and blinded for several days. My guess is that Saul's immediate experience of that mercy wasn't one of consolation or encouragement. But it was mercy. Is his mercy about being less strict and less demanding? In many cases, I suppose you could say yes. But we can't understand mercy if we restrict it to those categories. Because as you know, Jesus was more certainly, uh, was certainly more merciful than the Pharisees. But when it came to marriage, he was more strict than they were. When it came to material possessions and our need to be detached from them, he was more demanding than the Pharisees. And so one cannot understand mercy simply in terms of less rules or more rules, less strict or more strict. So then how are we to understand it? What is God after when he shows us mercy? If you're going to take anything home tonight from this address, take this home. God's purpose in pouring out mercy is to heal our hearts from those things that make us leave him. From those things that make us stay away from him from those things that make us not remain in him, from those things that separate us from him. The purpose of mercy for God is to heal our hearts so they no longer wander and can always be with him because he is our happiness. He is our fulfillment. And to leave him makes us unhappy. Getting all fired up here. <laughs> and dry mouth. Mercy is about healing our isolated, untrusting, rebellious hearts. Mercy is about God healing us so we can stay faithful because that is our happiness. This is what the mercy of God is after. And sometimes, as you parents know, that, 
that requires a hug. Sometimes it requires forgiving a person. But sometimes it requires an intervention that feels severe, like a family intervening with their addicted loved one. That's all mercy. I don't remember where I, where I heard this story. I'm not even sure if it's something that was made up or true, but I like it. And I got to stand up here for 50 minutes, and I got to fill this time up. It describes the mercy of God and what it's like. Thank you, Father. A dad, busy family, few kids, activities all over the place. Many of you can identify with that, I'm sure. The family meal was the only time they could stay together, could be a family together. And so mom and dad said to the kids, kids, this is non-negotiable. The family meal is non-negotiable. Activities can't conflict with that. We don't want you being late. We don't want you skipping them. Well, the, uh, the teenage boy started playing fast and loose with it come in late, a couple days later, didn't show up at all. Dad sat him down again and said, son, that's not acceptable. This keeps our family together. This takes priority over everything. And so, and so son, it's so, it's so important. If, if you miss again, you're going to come and sit at the table with us, and, and you're going to go without. Well, it was good for a couple of days. Then he showed up. Late one day, they're all sitting around eating, having a good time, laughing, talking as a family. And he showed up with his head down, and there was his empty plate. He sat down. Dad met his eyes. He met his dad's eyes. His dad looked at him. He knew uh, his dad was not pleased. And what did dad do? He got up, grabbed his full plate of food, walked over, put it in front of the sun, took the son's empty plate, sat it in front of him, and dad went without. That's the mercy of God. To pierce that boy, to pierce that boy, so that he stays with the family. And that's what that is about. The mercy of God. They shall look upon him whom they have pierced and they shall be healed. That is what mercy is after. Now on to the two words that unpack and describe mercy best for me at least. And the first one is a Latin word, misericordia, from which we translate mercy. Misericordia. Father Longenecker had us sing the Salve Regina. And in the opening line, Mater Misericordia, Mother of Mercy. It's a Latin word made up of two compound words. Misery, I think you can translate that. It translates into misery. (laughs) I'm a Latin scholar. Father, (laughs) Father Schneider taught me that. And then cordia, huh? the root of cordia is heart. So literally, misericordia is a heart for mercy. I mean a heart for misery. A heart, a heart that is moved by misery. A heart that, that leaps out and is attracted to misery. That's mercy, misericordia. So this should already give you a clue. I don't want to rob my thunder. But this already gives us a clue to receiving mercy. It is given in the place that isn't real pleasant. Often in the place we would like to avoid. And so we claim we would all love to have the mercy of God all the time. But we often run from the very place 
where he is pouring it out. And so a hint. In order to receive the mercy of God, we need to be able to open up our misery. My most beloved theologian turned 80 years old this month. I think I, uh, I, I, think I have a picture of her. There, there she is. Her name's Mary Richter, otherwise known as my mother. She... That, that's all it takes. Don't they look good? My mother doesn't have a degree in theology. She hasn't written 13 books. She hasn't even written a 15-page pamphlet. <laughs> but she taught me how mercy works. When I was a little child and I'd get sick in the middle of the night, come down with some stomach thing, and run up into her bedroom crying. Or when I would wipe out on a bike or a trike and skin my knee or skin my elbow and start crying and run to, and run to her. Or if I got in a scuffle with a brother who was uh, not being as he should be <laughs> and made me cry, I would run to my mom. And after I got done with the <laughs> stuff, mom would say these magical words. Tell me where it hurts. Mercy commands those words. Tell me where it hurts. Misericordia is about the heart of God being attracted to me where I experience a misery. And that needs to be open to him. This hurt isn't just the hurt that comes from personal sin where we need forgiveness. Certainly. That's why we call the sacrament of confession a sacrament of healing. The sacrament of mercy. But this hurt also comes to meet, or this mercy also comes to meet us in what I call all of existential misery. The misery experienced from the isolation and separation of being a fallen creature. For example, the young people here might be able to identify with this. For a young person, not knowing one's vocation. Am I supposed to be a priest or not? There's a misery in that. And God's mercy pours out there too. Or not being able to enjoy life as much as you would like. Someday I have been so crazily blessed. There are many days I have this, I should enjoy life more. And there's a misery in that. Knowing that you should want to pray and be drawn by prayer. Knowing that. But at the same time, wanting to rather play your hundredth game of solitaire. Anyone who starts to see how disordered that is, there's a misery in that. Not being able to pray the way one would like, not being able to quiet one's mind, and you pray an entire rosary. And when you're done, you realize you were distracted the entire time. Not having hope, one of the great miseries. Going bald at a young age. <laughs> I didn't read about that in a book. There's a misery in that. The young woman who is ready for marriage... And wants to be married so badly. But she has not met him yet. And all she can do is wait. There is a misery there. 
And God's mercy is concerned about that too. And if that woman can start to learn that that's where God draws near to her, her spiritual life starts to explode. Carrying within us the brokenness that came from our family of origin. God's mercy is attracted to these miseries too. And we need to learn how to receive the mercy of God in our heart through the exercise of faith there as well. The second word, it's one of my favorites. It's one of the greatest things that have come to me being a missionary of mercy. I learned this word. It's called, it's, uh, it's pronounced splachnizomai. Look at that. I could spell it to you in Greek, but that would be showing off. <laughs> splachnizomai. In the New Testament, the Greek word that describes what the mercy of God is like in the human heart of Jesus. The evangelists use this word, splachnizomai. You find it 12 times in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. For example, in the Gospels, it says, when Jesus saw the crowds, splachnizomai, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Or again, when the younger son was coming home after he came to his senses, it says, the father seeing him from a distance, splachnizomai, and ran out to meet him. Again, the good Samaritan, when he saw the man who fell into the hands of robbers in the ditch, splachnizomai, and he drew near and poured oil into his wounds. Or the widow of Nain, whose only son died, and the funeral procession was going through. And Jesus, seeing the funeral procession, splachnizomai. And he said, do not weep. I could keep going. <laughs> Use that at your next cocktail party and you'll impress people. <laughs> Splock needs so my. It's one of those nice words where you feel like you're almost saying a dirty word and you don't have to confess it. <laughs> Splock needs so my is often translated in the New American Bible, his heart was moved with pity. When Jesus saw the crowds, his heart was moved with pity for them because they were, like a sheep without, they were like sheep without a shepherd. The second way it's translated is moved with compassion. The father, seeing his son return, seeing him at a distance, was moved with compassion and ran out to meet him. Those are nice, but I think they're weak. The root of splach needs somaya, splachna, which is the Greek word for guts. Actually, entrails. In a month, some of you guys are going to be splachnaing a deer. <laughs> that wasn't planned. <laughs> I don't think it's a verb. I think it's just a noun. It means guts. So the translation of splach needs some eye. In the Richter Standard Version Bible <laughs> would be Jesus. When Jesus saw the crowds, his guts got tight with pity for them. The father seeing his son at a distance, his guts cramped up with compassion for him. The mercy of God is a visceral movement in God. It made Jesus' guts get tight. And so we should have confidence in how he pours out and how he's moved 
toward us. And all we got to learn to do is how to receive it in our hearts through the exercise of faith. Splach Nitsumai describes the posture of the heart of God toward our misery. Our misery opens his heart to pour out mercy. And now our heart simply learns how it needs to learn how to open to receive it. Now I'm ready to begin my talk. <laughs> I'm finished with the introduction. Five steps to receive mercy quickly. The first step, write these down. The first step, the first step in receiving mercy is believing in faith in God's merciful movement toward my misery. Believing in faith, my misery makes Jesus' guts get tight and cramp up to pour out mercy. Believing in faith in his movement toward my misery. Experiencing the mercy of God believe, begins with me believing in faith that Jesus now responds to my misery with the same splach nitsomai that he did to the people in the gospel. Seeing their misery moved his heart. It's the same with me. My misery draws him near. One must believe this in faith, dear people. Now listen closely. It's not as easy as it sounds because if you are understanding what I mean by misery, it's not as easy as it sounds because what I, under, what I mean by misery is it's the very place where we often feel like he's left us. where we're alone, rejected, there. The Father was pouring out his heart of mercy towards Jesus, there. But there is the very place where Jesus felt like he was being abandoned. That's where living in faith comes in. Second step. Believing in faith that God wants me, wants me to experience his mercy in heartfelt ways. So believing God's heart is open toward me right there, and then believing that he wants me to actually experience it in a heart felt way mercy happens in the world of the heart not in the world of ideas his mercy is about healing our hearts that wander and this requires experiencing his mercy in our hearts In order to illustrate this, I want to tell you a story about my good brother, Patrick, the farmer. I think I have a picture of his, there he goes, there he is. He and his lovely wife, Denise, and about half their kids. <laughs> I got permission from Patrick and Denise to share this. Patrick said, if, if you're going to put a picture up of mom and dad, would, would you also put one up of us? And so that's, that's why we have this up. <laughs> Patrick attended NDSU, not that other school. <laughs> and, and at one point, he went to Mass at, at the NDSU Newman Center, and at one point he started to notice this cute little pianist who played at Mass, and he just admired her from afar. Until one day he went to the Newman Center for a meeting. It was a planning committee meeting. 
And this young pianist happened to be at that meeting on the same planning committee. He hadn't talked to her yet. But sitting in that one-hour meeting, doors started to open. Stuff started to soften. Stuff started to be claimed in him. And so after the meeting, he waited for her, approached her, and asked her three questions. What's your name? Denise. Where are you from? Minnesota. What does your dad do? This was the bullseye. He's a dairy farmer. Bells started to go off. Because now he could have a wife and a milker all in one. <laughs> That's all. It's the only contact he had. He walks his few blocks home, gets to his house, opens the door, and says to his buddies, I just met the woman I'm going to spend the rest of my life with. And here is what I want you to focus on. You know what the first fruit of that was in him? The first fruit that came from what went on inside of him, which was mercy, is he wanted to see her again. Heck, he was even willing to go to the library to see her. <laughs> he wanted to be with her. That's what the mercy of God does to us in regards to Jesus. It makes us want to be with him. To stay with him. And not leave him. And you know what the second thing was? And this is how salvation happens. Because he wanted, because he wanted to see her again, because he wanted to stay with her, it started to change his behavior. He showered more. <laughs> he drank less. Memorize some poetry. That's how we're saved, dear people. Not by Pelagianism, but by receiving the mercy of God in our heart. And it makes us want Him. And then we start saying no to whatever we need to say no to to have Him. God is not a taskmaster. He is a lover that wins us over if we learn how to receive the mercy of God in our hearts through the exercise of faith. The third step, the third step, it's this basic. The third step. So believing in faith that this is God's posture, the second step believing that God wants me to actually experience it and not just have it as an idea in my head. Yeah, God's really showing me mercy now. But to experience it in heartfelt ways that heals my heart. And then the third is to desire his mercy. I know you're expecting something more profound than that. The third step in receiving his mercy is wanting it. Wanting, desiring His mercy. The healthy response of a healthy soul to the message of mercy is to want it. To want to experience it every day, every minute, because it makes me good. We desire to know the mercy of God, not as an idea, but to know the mercy of God concretely. With a heartfelt knowledge, 
The mercy of God is the healthiest desire in the human heart. And to want that isn't selfish. On February 12th, after being commissioned by Pope Francis as a missionary of mercy on Ash Wednesday, I was flying back from Rome on the transatlantic flight into the cities. I was sitting in seat 27C. It's an aisle seat with no other seat in front so I can stretch out my legs. And beside me, by the window, was Dr. Greg, an American evolutionary biologist who was teaching in Switzerland. And he was on his way back to visit family in Michigan from where he was. He was an enjoyable man, and we had a wonderful conversation for most of the hours on the way back. Through the course of the flight, we got to know each other, and at a certain point he asked me what I was doing in Rome. And I shared with him the whole mercy, missionary of mercy thing. Then at one point, after I felt comfortable about five hours into the flight, I asked him, Dr. Greg, if a missionary of mercy showed up at your church, what would you want him to say about the mercy of God? He thought for several minutes. He said, Monsignor, I, 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 I want to I think about that before I respond. So he sat for a couple of minutes in silence. And then he said, this is what I would like. I would like to hear, I have this, uh, I want to read it, quote, I would like to hear no nonsense stories of ordinary people like me experiencing the mercy of God in ordinary, unmiraculous ways. I would like him to show that the mercy of God is real and it can be real for me. He hit the bullseye. When I heard his answer, I was both excited and disappointed. I was disappointed because I had my barrels loaded with splock nitsomai and misericordia. And I wanted to teach him all I knew about mercy. But he wasn't interested in the idea of mercy. He was interested in experiencing it in concrete ways. In his own life. And that, in fact, is why his answer also excited me. Dear people, St. Teresa of Avila, doctor of the church, one of the greatest uh, doctors of spiritual theology in 2,000 years. She'd be in the top five, certainly. St. Teresa of Avila said, Inasmuch as you desire God, you will have him. Inasmuch as you desire God, you will find him. You have God as much as you want. And that translates into mercy. You have as much of the mercy of God as you want. Inasmuch as you want the mercy of God, you will find it. We receive the mercy of God by wanting it, desiring his mercy. And the more my desire expands, the more mercy I receive. The heart was made to receive mercy. It's like my stomach. This was made to receive pizza. And the more I want it, the more it expands. <laughs> to desire his mercy. So believing in faith that where I, in my misery, he is pouring out. Believing in faith that he wants me to encounter that. You guys, Pentecost wasn't an idea. Pentecost was a heartfelt event. Meeting the risen Christ wasn't an idea. It was a heartfelt event. And then third, desiring that. Fourth, and perhaps the most important, the fourth step in receiving the mercy of God in our hearts through the exercise of faith is to then bring that desire 
to Jesus. To want mercy from God and to bring that desire for his mercy to Jesus. To relate it to Jesus. When Dr. Greg shared with me his response, I thanked him and then I asked him, Doctor, would you want to experience his mercy in your life a lot? Do you often want this? He said, well, of course. Then I asked him a question that I ask all of us tonight for you to take home with you. I asked him, how often do you bring that desire to him? When you want that, how often do you bring it to him? How often do you express to Jesus this desire for mercy in your heart? He said, I don't. So what do you do, I asked. Listen closely. He replied, I think about it. I think about how great it would be if it in fact was possible. I think about it. Sound familiar? Faith receives from God. That's what the gift of faith does. It enables the soul to receive from the heart of God. But only, only after it relates to God. Only after it relates to God. Faith receives because it relates to God. It turns to God. It brings to God. It entrusts to God. Everything that we are longing for exists somewhere, and that somewhere is in the heart of Christ. And faith reaches into it. Faith turns to the heart of Jesus. Faith that does not relate, faith that ends up with me thinking about it, is in fact not faith. Faith that doesn't relate is not faith. Where we lack faith, these beautiful desires only cause us to become self-absorbed. And we just think about it. Let me explain with a silly example. I'm glad the bishop is in here. I was self-conscious thinking he might be here and then he would uh, he would hear this. I trust this isn't being taped or anything like that. <laughs> but it makes, it makes the point. It makes the point I'm trying. So imagine that on this stage at this very moment, a 500 pound rock falls from the sky and lands on my foot. I told you it was silly. But the silliness doesn't end there. At the same time, it just so happens that standing right beside me, as this 500-pound rock falls from the sky and lands on my foot, at that very moment, onto the stage w walks the 500-pound rock-lifting champion of the whole wide world. What do you think I would do? Very quickly, a desire in my heart would rise up that says, I wish this rock was not on my foot. I would like this rock off my foot. I would desire that deeply. And then, when that desire comes up, do you think I would sit there wondering what book I could read? to figure out how to get this rock off my foot? Or do you think I would sit there wondering, I wonder if this guy would lift this rock off my foot? Or if I would sit there thinking, why do 500 pound rocks always land on my foot? <laughs> it's not fair. 
you know what I'd do? I would take that desire and I would turn to the man, the 500 pound rock lifting champion of the whole wide world, and I would say, sir, I know you can do this. I desire you to take this rock off my foot. Would you do that for me? And 30 seconds later, when it still hurts, I would do that again. And then if I knew that this guy was God and knew what was best for me and only and always did what's best for me, if he wasn't taking it off, I would start now in bringing that desire to him, also asking him, what is the good thing that's supposed to come from this? Because you're not doing what I know you could That is how one receives mercy. It's that easy and it's that difficult. It's difficult. It's difficult to consistently and honestly bring one's desires to God. Imagine the script of your desires on any given day. Imagine them. Imagine how many you don't bring to God. And you just think about. After being a priest for over 20 years, dear people of God, and coming to know my own heart and how God works in it, and the hearts of many friends of Jesus... I am convinced that, that the, one of the most grave consequences of original sin is this, having great desires to experience God concretely, but not relating them to him in a meaningful, consistent manner for 10 seconds and then going back to solitaire. That's why we're not receiving. Because we're not relating. And we stop relating because we're weak in faith. In many ways, it's easy to be a practical atheist. A practical atheist not believing that the 500 pound rock lifting champion of the whole world dwells in me. And so I go to him. Fifth, they started me eight minutes late. Fifth, <laughs> the fifth step, dear people, is the why. The why behind the other four steps. It's the why behind the other four steps. What we are after. What is our end game? I began with talking about what is God's end game with mercy. What's he after? He is after, he is, his mercy is after healing my heart from that which makes me leave him. That pulls me from him. That makes me stop staying with him. And so now the fifth step is what is our purpose? What is our purpose in wanting mercy? What is our end game? The fifth step addresses what we're after in wanting to receive his mercy. What is the reason we're bringing all this to him? What is the fire behind all this? I assert that if it is the fire of the Holy Spirit, then the reason I want is mercy. The reason I'm doing all this, the reason I'm bringing it to the 500-pound rock-lifting champion of the whole wide world, the reason 
I want to be healed is so that I will not leave him when the cross comes. I want mercy to heal me so I don't leave my dear friend at the cross. So I won't just be a fair weather friend. Because that's the only place salvation happens. I want his mercy to heal me so I will stay with him there. Because I want to share in his self-giving love. I want to be not only a receiver of mercy, but a source of his healing, merciful love to this world. In other words, the reason I want his mercy is I want to become another Christ. That's what I'm after. That's my end game. I want to be like Christ. May we have enough faith to believe that his mercy can make us so if we but give him permission. Jesus, I trust in you. Amen. Thank you, everyone.